Hi everyone, welcome to Unlocking Innovation. It's a collaborative effort between Intuitive and IMDA's Open Innovation Platform. I'm Carrie. I'll be your MC for today. As an online networking seminar, this event will introduce you to partners that you can work with in building a stronger ecosystem and a more creative community. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody that if you have questions, you may type them into the Q&A box below in the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll take questions right after each speaker, so do post your questions continuously throughout the event. Um, in case of any confusion, please address the question to the speaker that you would like to ask the question to, okay? So the Open Innovation Platform, a little bit about us, we are a virtual crowdsourcing platform that bridges real business challenges or digitalization opportunities of enterprises to tech firms. Challenges hosted on the OIP are supported by a structured innovation process, including refinement, curation, and scouting of solvers. Problem owners gain access to a diverse pool of solvers, both locally and regionally, while tech firms receive cap capability support for evaluation and prototyping. The OIP has seen over 170 challenges hosted over the last two years, and we have close to 10,000 solvers in our ecosystem. I guess some of you are here with us today, so welcome. Here we bridge real business challenges um, and we also encourage tech solvers like yourself to collaborate also. Therefore, this event will actually give you opportunities to collaborate outside of the OIP. So gentle reminder, any questions you have um, are to be asked in the Q&A box below and we appreciate you taking the time to join us today and we look forward to a fruitful session. So it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Shava Vijaya Saradi from Intuitive Private Limited to give us an introduction on what they do. Dr. Shava, over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Shava. Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Hi, this is uh, Chava from Intuitive. Uh, as you see, Intuitive is a wholly owned subsidiary of NTU. Uh, that's why you see two logos, NTU here and Intuitive here. We are the innovation and enterprise office at NTU. The mandate for us is basically to commercialize research output that is coming out from NTU and also to develop ecosystem for innovation and enterprise. So I will explain what this means uh, in two minutes and then we will move on. So basically NTU is a huge university. We have about 35,000 students and uh, we have different schools. The schools go all the way from computer science to uh, chemical, bio biological engineering to mechanical, material science, electronics, energy efficiency, different varieties. And also it goes into humanities and business school. Uh, including NIE, we also have uh, education-based uh, schools. So there are lots of professors. We have about 1,500 professors and we have about 30,000 uh, 30, uh, students. So all these people will be conducting a lot of research during the years. So during this process, we will have lots of IP assets, intellectual property, whether it be patents, it could be know-how, it could be secrets, it could be trademarks, design patents, um, all these things. So uh, mandate for Intuitive is to manage these IPs. So we have within the Intuitive, we have teams that help us in the back end. Uh, to manage the legal processes, to manage the intellectual property processes, and also to commercialize these uh, IP assets that we build during the course of research. So me and I have some colleagues, uh, B. Kim and I have Jian Shin, uh, we three basically handle anything related to inter uh, Infocom and communication technologies and particularly related to software. Uh, so Basically, uh, we uh, represent the business development team. We liars are, we are kind of in between, between the academic and industry. So we try to meet industry and understand the technological needs and try to match what kind of IP assets we have uh, so that we can push out the technologies and IP assets that we have into a uh, commercial world. So that's the first part. The second part is basically to develop the vibrant ecosystem. What do you mean by that? 
So we have lots of uh, events that we conduct and we train our students and faculty to spin off companies. So you will understand those two mandates in detail using this slide. So we have entrepreneur education system here and we have the technology transfer. We have different variety of events all the way from competitions to challenges to networking events. We have research overseas opportunities. We have grants and investment. We have infrastructure and community. Let's take one by one. I will not take more than 10 minutes. I don't want to be in between the actual talks on this, but uh, let's give a little bit of understanding here. So we have overseas entrepreneurship program where we send our students to overseas colleges, both to the startups and also to the colleges to get experience. And we do run accelerator programs like the Lean Launchpad program. We run startup school programs, hackathons, and industry events or industry innovation challenges. Uh, some of them you can see on our website, which I will show and share later. And the next one is basically licensing. So some of the technologies that you are going to see later today, we are open for either collaboration or for the purpose uh, also for licensing. So we do have lots of spin-offs and uh, we help the spin-offs in reaching out to their partners and collaborators. And also we'll, we help our spin-offs in raising money, either from angel investors or government grants or private VCs. And uh, in sometimes we do know that we have some limitations because uh, our professors may not have expertise or connections with the business world in a particular field. So we look out for partners from outside who has experienced and who has access to the market. And then we do a joint venture with those external collaborators. And then coming to the events, we have uh, now, this is a special year, so we, we, uh, we don't have physical events uh, like Makan, Makan night, uh, but this used to happen every Friday of the last, every last Friday of the month. Uh, so people come together, the previous uh, startup owners or the founders who has created the startups, they share their experiences, why they failed, why they were successful, and uh, uh, we bring in different people, including the legal people, HR people, and successful entrepreneurs and stuff like that. They share different variety of uh, problems that the potential uh, founders may face. And uh, we do also conduct the government to government events like India Singapore Hackathon. This time we are going to have that uh, ASEAN Singapore Hackathon. Um, we also conduct talks by different people. And we do have lots of space, incubation space, but that incubation space is offered to our own uh, spin-offs and startups from NTU. And we have hard desking space and open innovation labs um, to support the research. If we like the ideas and we want to bring that into commercial world, we do have some small grants, the startup grants that uh, goes from $10,000 to $30,000 to $50,000. And we also have uh, proof of concept grants, our gap funding grants, uh, which is about $250,000 that is given to our own faculty, not to the outsiders. Uh, but we do help outside companies in, uh, because NTU, our intuitive is uh, basically one of the approved mentorship program. We are under, under that program. So we do help outside companies in incubating. And we do have uh, SRIF, S Strategic Research Innovation Fund, that we invest into uh, selected spin-off companies from NTU, our NTU-linked companies. As I said, we also facilitate or we provide networking events to uh, angel investors and then venture capitals and uh, different variety of uh, private investors. And apart from that, we do conduct lots of other events, which I will show you later on NTU web page. So uh, we have two locations. Uh, we have one in NTU itself, which is uh, 71 Nanyang Drive. Um, sorry, yeah, 71 Nanyang Drive. And another one in uh, Block 79, Ayer Raja. Uh, so in both places, uh, we provide incubation facilities. In NTU, of course, we have a lot more space. Uh, so we have open innovation labs, and we also have dry and wet labs we also have clean 1000 uh, class 1000 clean rooms and uh, we do have offices in uh, shanghai and uh, outside in china particularly and we are trying to expand our offices uh, in other parts of asian region <clears throat> uh, 
So these are some of the programs that we conduct. Uh, Idea Sync, probably you might have heard very recently. Uh, that's one of those. And uh, we do innovation challenges, uh, lots of uh, Rakuten uh, we have done recently and YCH we have done in uh, Dyson, one of the events we have done recently. And we do conduct uh, boot camps and lean launchpad programs for our own spin-offs and startups regularly. <clears throat> so this uh, we have shared. However, uh, we do have lots of mentor pool uh, that helps us, uh, our spin-offs and startups uh, to go through and also get introduced to the uh, outside world and business world to get partners and collaborators. Um, and we do conduct networking events for both uh, collaborations and also for the investment purposes, which we have covered earlier. So these are some of our startups. Um, just to name a few of them, uh, Wi-Fine basically is acquired by Rukas uh, Technologies, which is a US uh, MNC, mainly into wireless communications. Uh, we'd have, we have other, some of other companies that are moved to US um, and uh, we have spin-offs. So the spin-offs are started by the faculties, startups are started by the students. That is how we differentiate. And uh, we have spin-offs. You might have seen recent news in Nanofilm. Nanofilm has uh, gone to IPO after about 15 to 20 years, about close to 20 years. Um, and uh, we have some other companies that uh, we have exited uh, and we sold uh, to uh, MNCs. Uh, and we do have, as I said, joint ventures. For example, ST Electronic Satellite Systems uh, is a joint venture with ST. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of everyone, but if you have any interest, uh, of course, you can reach out to us. So these are our contacts. Uh, these three people, uh, it's me, Chava, and uh, I have my colleagues uh, online, uh, Bikim and uh, Jianxin. Uh, these emails uh, you can note down and uh, the video will also be circulated later together with the slides to all the attendees. If you have any interest in collaborating or uh, to reach out to some specific professors uh, that, who are working in ICT or uh, Infocom communication technologies or software, anything that is falls into software, artificial intelligence, big data, mm -hmm. analytics, and stuff like that, um, NLP, uh, vision and stuff, anything related to software, basically. You can reach out to us. Uh, we'll be happy to connect you and work with you. And I just want to share before I conclude my talk, uh, you can uh, go into these pages where you can find some more information. But uh, let me show one thing on the Hopit, how you can actually use this Hopit tool, which is available on our web page and web webpage to find out if you are looking for a particular professor or a, an expert, or if you are looking for uh, people who are working in a particular field how you can search that I want to show. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, can somebody say yes or no? Yes, yes, we can see your okay. screen. Okay, so you can see my browser, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a, a intuitive web page. Uh, you can find all the information here. You can find all our companies uh, here. Uh, you can filter it by uh, different varieties uh, and you can see all the stuff in here and our initiatives, our events, all those things you can see here. But the most important thing is uh, search button. So if you want to search for a particular researcher, uh, you can type it in here. If you want to search in entire web pages, you can do the search here. Let's say if you want to do uh, a particular professor, uh, Ang Yu Sun, for example, uh, then when you search, basically it will display Ang Yu Sun, and then you can go through his, uh, this is live, uh, so you can see uh, it's loading up. So you can see what are the projects, where he is from, which school he is from, what are his interests, and uh, what are the active projects, what are the publications, current mm -hmm. publications, what are his patents, what kind of news articles he is involved, either news channels, video, or uh, in the press, um, and his contact info. This is one way of searching. The other way of searching is basically you, you go here and then put, uh, for example, I don't know, artificial intelligence. So you can search different people, names, you can go to anybody, you can look into the, all these people are working in uh, those specific areas you can look into. 
are like for let's say uh, cancer so these are the people who are working either on the materials or drug or pharmaceuticals and uh, that are related to cancer maybe therapy or maybe diagnostics and stuff like that so if you want to be specific you have to basically search uh, using a specific term uh, but this can be used either to find a, a an expert uh, with the name or experts in a specific research area so this is one of the things i want to highlight and then you can also go to ipi all our tech offers are available there and you can also search on intuitive web page uh, as such uh, on the tech offers also so that's it uh, if you want to reach out to any of us you can also uh, reach out to intuitive info at intuitive.sg uh, we'll be happy to get back to you uh, if you have any questions uh, please uh, feel free to ask me thank you dr chava thank you so much thanks for sharing um, very happy that we're collaborating together on this event. Um, so I would like to next welcome, um, it is my pleasure to welcome Prof, uh, Prof Xie. Prof Xie Li Hua is from uh, Nanyang Technological, uh, Technological University, NTU, Singapore. He's going to share about a non-intrusive Wi-Fi indoor positioning and human activity recognition system. This sharing focuses on the indoor positioning, which is essential to IoT and has become increasingly in demand. So um, over to you, Prof Xie. Uh, Chawa, can you stop your sharing so that I can share? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you see yeah. my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, share the, some work we have been doing on the Wi-Fi. Many two part. One is Wi-Fi based localization. The other one is Wi-Fi sensing. And uh, for localization, basically, is we want to localize uh, a person or a device which is uh, kind of uh, equipped with a Wi-Fi device. For the sensing part here, which is basically device-free, that means that the person um, do not carry any uh, device with Wi-Fi. So we all know that uh, in outdoor environment, we have a, a GPS which can help us to do the navigation for all different kind of application. However, for the indoor environment here, there isn't any uh, uh, a kind of universal solutions. Um, it's, we have a different solution for, for example, using UWB and RFID or Wi-Fi, depending on the application, depending on the, uh, the accuracy, accuracy requirement, and also depending on the, the scale of the application scenario and so on. Now, the reason we want, we've uh, start working on Wi-Fi about 10 years ago, is because Wi-Fi is getting more and more uh, widely used, not only in the, uh, the, the office building, but also at home and uh, shopping mall and so on. So we can say that the Wi-Fi is available everywhere nowadays so that uh, we, if we can leverage on the Wi-Fi um, device routers to do the localization, that, that means that uh, we don't need to install any infrastructure. Um, so the... The merit of Wi-Fi based localization here basically uh, is a nearly zero infrastructure cost. And, and secondly, is that most of the mobile device nowadays are Wi-Fi enabled. And uh, of course, there are, there are many Wi-Fi um, based localization systems available. And some uh, of the job back include that uh, they need to install the app in the user side or in mobile device. And secondly, they use mobile device to scan the router in order to achieve the localizations. And thirdly, um, because of the using the mobile device to scan the router, so in this case, it will consume the power so that the power of the mobile device will deplete very quickly. And secondly, uh, the sampling rate of the mobile device typically is lower. So in this case, the accuracy of the localization will, be, will not be higher. And so on, right? So, um, so what, what we aim to do is to achieve a more accurate and reliable user friendly Wi Fi based uh, localization system. So, the idea we will do is instead of using the um, uh, wi mobile device to scan the router, we actually use uh, enhance the router so that the router has the capability to 
uh, scan the mobile device to get the Wi-Fi signal. Uh, so, in, so the router here will scan the uh, mobile device and then the, uh, the nearby router will send the information to the server and server will then calculate uh, the, uh, the location and then use the web browser and uh, the user or the mobile, mobile device uh, uh, carrier can, can actually access and then to know the locations. So the advantage of doing so is that uh, you don't need to install apps on your user ID, uh, on your user uh, mobile uh, device. And secondly, that uh, the, uh, we use the commercial off the shelf, the Wi-Fi router to do the um, to do the data collection and the calculation. And uh, so in this case here, you don't actually consume the, um, the, the power in your, in your mobile phone or mobile device and something that is higher can achieve higher accuracy. And in the meantime, of course, in this case, we can uh, uh, check multiple occupants simultaneously in real time. So of course, the uh, the, there are different methods for the or algorithm for the localization, and quite most popular approach here is to use a machine learning or Wi-Fi uh, fingerprinting based approach. And uh, so this approach here can achieve a high accuracy. However, there there are some challenges. First of all, of course, Wi-Fi signal we know is uh, quite easily affected by multipass, and uh, how to overcome some. Uh, multi-pass effect to have a better accuracy and some of what we have done uh, a few years back. And secondly is the, um, you know, the, it's uh, quite vulnerable to the environmental dynamic, meaning that uh, when if we develop our system, change our system uh, today, then tomorrow we change our uh, furniture setting, layout, or we have people moving, uh, more people or different people moving around then the environment dynamic here will affect the accuracy of the localization. So how to overcome this problem? And also the in the, uh, the fingerprinting here, you typically use one, one or two kind of the device to collect the data. And, and then in this case, we know different uh, device or mobile phone here have different uh, Wi-Fi chipset here. So in this case, if the system is uh, developed based on one set of, of the device, then when the user carry another kind of mobile phone, then in this case, the your localization accuracy will be poor. So the, how to overcome this problem? So we call the heterogeneity of the mobile device. And uh, we also develop method here to overcome this problem. Of course, the other problem, including the cost, that uh, means that uh, the, because you need to do data collection, calibration, that typically is the time consuming. So one way we do it, of course, we, we you know, start here, we develop a mobile robot here to which can be used to collect data and to do the calibration. The other one, of course, we can leverage on uh, the router itself or some mobile phone. For example, we, we know those uh, certain mobile phone uh, is carried by a certain person and then they're sitting in a fixed cubicle over there, then we know the location here. So in this case, we can actually use that to to do collect the data and then do some of the uh, extrapolation so that, that we can save some of the uh, calibration or data collection costs. So we de developed this system called Wi-Fi, we call Wing IPS. And uh, this uh, advantage here is that uh, you, you, don't, you, you actually don't need to require to install the apps on a mobile device and the sampling rate is higher, and then uh, you don't consume the, the battery on your mobile phone, and accuracy we can be higher than what uh, available in the current other system. And then um, we can provide the API for location-based service, and then can do navigation using the web browser and so on. And some of the uh, application here, uh, for example, navigation in our lab, and then we can also use the, this, uh, you know, the, the wing IPS here to know the occupant distribution. For example, in certain zone here, you have, may have a more um, per number of person occupied area, and this can help us to manage the uh, better manage the uh, building uh, air conditioning system, for example, or in the case of emergency here to do the evacuation and so on. Right? So that is, could be helpful. And the other application, we also use in deploy the system for the 
controlling the light on and off and so on. And of course, uh, with uh, this uh, wing IPS here, you can collect the, for example, in your office or in your lab here, over the time, for, for example, from, uh, from uh, Monday to Sunday and from 7.30 all the way to, to the night here, what is the occupant distribution so that you can use this information here to uh, manage your building to provide a better uh, energy efficiency and comfort and so on. The other thing we have been doing, what we have, we have done is to do the kind of seamless uh, navigation because in outdoor, we know we can use the GPS and in some semi indoor environment, for example, the corridor over there, in this case, you can actually use IP kind of one dimension and the indoor you have Wi-Fi. So when you move from outdoor to semi outdoor and then to indoor here, how and can we can have a, a history different system here can be uh, seamlessly integrate so that uh, you know perhaps person uh, navigation of the can not, will not be have any interruption here. So the key here is you need to have a way to actually identify when to switch and how to switch and so on. Right? So for example, even in a corridor environment, you still be able to receive uh, uh, satellite signal and in this GPS still not reliable, not accurate, but it's still on and so on. Right? So we have developed system to do the uh, switching and then to achieve a uh, seamless navigation. Uh, here's the radio, actually we navigate from outdoor to indoor, but then uh, I think due to the time here, maybe I just quickly move. Uh, so in outdoor uh, is a Google map and then we have a covers corridor. Then over there we have some uh, beacon to navigate around the, uh, uh, the corridor. And then, you know, when you go to a certain location, which I mean, when, when you come to indoor environment uh, in, in the building here, then your indoor map will cover the Google map. And then if you can click where you want to go, then in this case, the system here will navigate you. And of course, if you need to go different level, then well, actually system will uh, you know, allow you now take the leap to which level and so on, right? So in any here, then you can navigate to the, you, the location you want to go. Right? And uh, to just to summarize that uh, the system here, we actually developed a few years back and then we uh, participate in the Microsoft competition. And that is a few years. And then uh, at that time we achieved a third place in, in terms of accuracy. And of course, we also in much improved the, the system over the year. And we test the system in uh, 11 different uh, environments. Okay, so, um, these are the video link, uh, which is in the slide later on, if you can take a look. And application, I, I, I don't want to go into detail, for example, the localization, navigation, right? and also building management, and also in the retail mall, you can provide it, the, uh, you know, that, uh, to uh, contact, so the advertisement to the uh, customer, and know where uh, frequently those, these customer, customer go. And in the, for example, in hospital, you can use the system here to better manage your manpower to provide more efficient services and so on. And of course, similarly in other uh, public location. Now, the other uh, the topic I want to talk about here is called smart sensing, uh, which mainly is to leverage on the Wi-Fi here to know what is the person is doing or and so on, right? So, but the person here now, does not carry a mobile phone. So we call device device free uh, kind of activity recognitions. So of course we, we know that, that you can have a camera which can be used to, uh, to, to, to do detect the human activity, but then we know camera has a disadvantage here. For example, you may, uh, camera is affected by lighting and also some place here is the blind spot here, camera cannot find it, cannot detect it. And of course camera in uh, many locations here, you will have a privacy concern, right? And uh, the other thing is you ask the person here to carry a device, so available, available device, which is uh, not so convenient. For example, elderly at home here, they don't want to carry a mobile phone. All the, all the way when they're at home and so on, right? And uh, of course, use other system, uh, radio frequency based kind of the detection, which is a kind of costly and so on. So 
we want to use uh, just use the existing Wi-Fi router here at your home or at the office here to do some uh, activity like initials. So uh, the advantage of here, of course, is uh, device free. And then secondly, is a less intrusive to the user privacy, right? Because uh, we, we don't now use the camera to, 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 to take the picture of the person and so on. And then they, you can reuse the existing infrastructure and coverage can be larger. Right? So the idea here is that any movement of the human, for example, the human hands here, right? Uh, during the gesture, what outer or the change, the propagation of the Wi-Fi signal from transmitter to the receiver. And this we can, can be observable at the receiver side. So we're trying to accept the feature from the received signal and then to know what the activity of uh, this person is carrying out. And this was based on the uh, so-called channel state information. Uh, channel state information here basically is a consist of the uh, amplitude and consist of the phase. Just now for localization, we just use the receive signal strength. Uh, but uh, here you can have a much more uh, finer grade of the data here. Uh, currently for 4G or 5G, you can have over 50 or over 100 channel of uh, data you can use. So you can see that uh, this actually the the, uh, the signal from those channel here provides a very detailed kind of the, uh, data you can use for the activity recognition. So of course the question is how do you use it? That's uh, one key problem here. So the key here is those uh, movement or the channel state information uh, is quite sensitive to the human body movement, right? So that we can use it to do the detection of the human movement. Okay, so the uh, system which is available, right? But uh, they all leverage on the, the laptop. So we the user require laptop and also re require external NIC adapter here as a receiver. So, and so this uh, kind of the device is not so suitable for larger scale uh, implementation. So what we want here is basically is the CSI, the channel state information enables IoT platform, which is just some transceiver, a uh, ch transmitter, just a Wi-Fi router or Wi-Fi chipset there to transmitter and then you have receiver here. So you can obtain the CSI data from regular data frame, collect the data, and then uh, and then you do the analysis. Just leverage on the commercial of the show, the IoT device. So the our system here, uh, advantage or merit of our system here is we actually based on the router, right? The Wi-Fi router as a receiver or the other like uh, Wi-Fi chipset here as a transmitter. So in this case, uh, we actually, our system here can, can um, be applied to uh, over 100 channels, so which can have a better CSI sensing data and able to sense cause and find great activity. So it depends on the application. But if you just want to use it for the intrusion, intrusion detection here, maybe in this case, you may just use a cause uh, kind of, the, uh, it is a cause uh, activity recognition here, then you just, uh, can the, the ergo here can be implemented just in the router here. You can detect whether there's a people coming into the room or not. But if you want to do more fine grained uh, uh, recognition, for example, to know whether the human's movement of the hand here is up or right or left, then in this case, we will need to uh, employ uh, more kind of machine learning in which will require some computing resources cannot be done in the router and in this case, the feature or data will be transmitted to the, the, the over the cloud here, and then the server will do the calculation and so on. So our design here, the nobody is uh, we use a deep learning uh, network here to achieve a better accuracy. And then we because the system here, you change from one device, one environment here need to be applied in other environment. So in this case, we apply the general learning to achieve a better robustness uh, under dynamic circumstance. Okay, so this I just show the one one on the intrusion
Okay, so the, the other is use the uh, so-called gesture recognition. So basically we will leverage on the, the GSI data here and trying to extract some robust feature to recognize the, the human hands movement here. Right? And uh, that just uh, based on very few shots of searching uh, shading. Okay, so this to overcome some of domain shift here. So this application here is at a smart home you want to use you are just use your hand here to control your TV, for example, uh, and control your other lighting or other devices at home. So just to show one example here, uh, for example, we, we, we want to use our hand here to control the, or select the TV program or to control the TV. So you can forward, backward, and uh, so to control. I mean, to, to show that uh, we use the hand gesture here and with the Wi-Fi to detect hand gesture uh, to control the, the device to make the device here smarter. Okay, so that's the uh, the smart home here. Okay, so there are application here, including just now the intruder detection here. This will be can be used for security, and secondly, we can also use to uh, identify the person, or what we call the person authentications. For example, certain office here, if there are other illegal person or person from outside not belong to this uh, office here coming in and or not, so this can be also used, uh, or the system here can be used to do this kind of detection. Okay, of course, the other one just now I mentioned here to enable smart control or energy savings. And uh, you can use that to control your uh, device or your uh, the operation of the other robot or something like that. And uh, one application also quite uh, promising is the uh, elderly at home because uh, typically we don't want to install camera, but then we want to know, for example, this elder, how many hours he's walking around, how many hours he's lying on the bed, whether there's any situation here, and he he's fall down or he has not been moving for a long time, or so so so. Right? So in this case, um, they leverage this uh, Wi-Fi device free detection to to know it. Okay, so that's all for uh, of my sharing. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Prof. Sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for the sharing. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A box below and we can ask them to Prof. Sir later or we'll take the questions after the event and we'll still try and answer them, yeah? So for our next two speakers, um, I would love if you guys have questions, please put them into the Q&A box and we'll take it after each speaker. Um, it's my pleasure now to welcome Dr. Uh, Basili uh, Sidora from Aprismatic Private Limited to share on operational end-to-end -end data security. So reminder for the questions, please put them into the Q&A box. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Vasili, uh, up to you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, great. 
Uh, all right, so then uh, let me start. I will tell about what we do in Aprismatic. Uh, Aprismatic is a spin-off company from NTU created with support from uh, Intuitive. Uh, and uh, what we are working on is end-to-end -end data security. Um, and we're trying to use our uh, research in the university and the latest developments in the data security field and apply them to create a uh, new age of data security products. So the problem is that uh, if you watch the news in the area of data security, you will know that the amount of incidents and the amount of data leaked in this incidents grows exponentially. So this is a news uh, article from uh, early 2016 talking about the results of 2015. Um, almost 4,000 incidents during 2015 exposed over 736 million records. That sounds like a lot, but by 2020 standards, that's like Tuesday evening. Since then, it just grew exponentially and there is millions of records of personal of healthcare, financial records leaking out every day uh, from companies all over the world. And the amount of damage that brings also grows uh, in the, at the same rate. So the data breaches are in the news every single day. Uh, in 2018, so by our estimates in 2018, every person uh, was affected by about one, two data leaks. Uh, in 2019, about three or five data leaks per year. Uh, and so in 2020, my guess, this went up uh, to double digits, 10 or 20 data leaks affecting each one of us every year. So our data is being stolen uh, all, all the time. Every year we are being victims of, of these situations. And not only this is damaging to us as the owners of the data, uh, this is also very much damaging to the companies who operate the data. Uh, on average, Last year, the data leak was costing a company from four to $8 million. Uh, and per record, per personal record, that was about $250 per regular record and about $430 per medical record. And the top reasons for the data leaks were misconfigured data infrastructure, insider attacks, and only on the third place, it was external attackers. So most of the cases, this was either a mistake done by uh, IT specialists in the company or insider threats. Both are really hard to um, mitigate. So how are companies usually mitigating IT uh, security risks? So the traditional approaches uh, your typical cybersecurity um, set of tools that you would find in almost any company today. Uh, so what we do is network segregation. So we are trying to uh, build a wall between the outer world and the inside world, world uh, internal infrastructure of the company. Sometimes we also try to uh, separate different sections of uh, the uh, internal network into, into separate uh, sections, each uh, ha having its own perimeter defense. Access control, again, trying to understand who is allowed to go in and who is not allowed uh, to go in. Data address encryption. So this is when we encrypt the data that is just being stored at the moment that's not being in use. Uh, so when we save the data, we encrypt it. Uh, logging is uh, writing down everything that happens. And in the event that something does happen uh, of, of some kind of um, threat is realized, we can go back and look at the logs and try to figure out what exactly happened and where we uh, made a mistake. And uh, lately, uh, based on the logs written by the systems, we also can find AI-based intrusion detection where AI systems would look through the logs trying to find something unusual uh, happening, something um, that is not fitting the normal pattern of uh, your network activity in the system. 
All of this uh, together is uh, so-called perimeter defense or fence uh, security. And when people are creating this fence security, uh, most likely they envision that they are building something like um, something, uh, something like this around their system. Uh, if they are slightly more delusional, they might see it as something like this or this. But in reality, in most cases, this is what it looks like. It's uh, patchy, it has holes, and it doesn't really work. And the reason for that is that what, this worked five, 10 years ago, but today the systems are become, became so big and so dynamic that uh, building an efficient wall around this uh, is no longer a, uh, a possibility. Uh, 10 years ago, you can ask any IT specialist, how many servers do you think you have in your company? And they would give you an exact number. We have 246 servers. Uh, these are the locations of this service. These are configurations of this service. Today, ask uh, any IT specialist how many uh, machines they have. They wouldn't be able to answer this question. And not only because the number is so big, but also because it's dynamic. It could be 10 servers, uh, in the morning and then later the systems automatically scales up to 10,000 servers uh, and then during lunchtime it scales back to 500 servers and then it goes up and down all the time and it's all happening automatically uh, and also lately companies are starting to adopt a new approach called serverless where you don't even know where your application runs and how many servers are uh, maintaining your applications and you don't know where they are located some are in the cloud some are on premise the complexity of this grows uh, at an incredible rate. And the same old approaches to providing security uh, no longer are as efficient as they used to be. So in research, there are many new developments in the area of uh, data security and cybersecurity. And I want to talk about uh, some of those and specifically about the ones that we at Aprismatic are working on and trying to create uh, products based on. So the three main um, areas I want to cover today are uh, oblivious data processing, federated learning, and um, uh, audit trail and event sourcing. So we'll start with uh, oblivious data processing and there are several um, topics here that uh, we can cover. There is more than that. There are other uh, things that fall in the category of oblivious data processing. There is encrypt uh, searchable encryption. There is order preserving encryption and other things like that. Uh, but these are the more sophisticated um, te techniques that could be found in, in this um, category. So we'll start with uh, homomorphic uh, cryptography. So the whole idea of homomorphic cryptography is uh, we want to encrypt our data, but the usual problem with encrypted data is that as soon as we encrypt it, we can't really work with it. And if we want to work with it, if we want to do analysis over it, or if we want to find a specific record, we have to first decrypt the data. So homomorphic cryptography is an approach to encrypting the data in such a way that we are able to work with uh, the data without decrypting it. So here is a very simple example. Uh, let's assume that number five is our secret key. And our encryption is we take the message, the, the number, and we multiply it by our secret key. And when we want to decrypt, we divide it back by secret key. So if you don't know that the secret key is five, you don't know what to divide the ciphertext by. So you can't figure out what was the original um, value. So of course, this is not a real um, crypto system, but it is good enough for illustration. So in homomorphic cryptography, uh, let's say this is the data owner and the data set that the data owner has is two numbers, seven and five. And we want uh, some cloud service to provide us with a uh, service where we want to find the sum of our values. And we don't want the cloud service to know what the values were. So we encrypt our values using our uh, crypto system. And so 35 and 25 are our ciphertext. We multiply seven by five and we get 35, same with five. Then these two ciphertexts 
are safe to send to the cloud uh, processor. And the cloud processor doesn't know that the secret key is five, so they can't figure out what was the original value. So our data is safe. So now if we want to find what was the sum of our original values, we can instruct the cloud provider to just add up uh, the ciphertexts and we get the 60, which is again, an encrypted value. And it is an encrypted result of this analysis. So if we get this number back and then apply our decryption, so divide by five, we get uh, 12 and 12 is indeed the sum of five and seven. So this is a general idea of how homomorphic cryptography works. We encrypt values and then we're still able to do certain operations with the encrypted uh, values without decrypting them. Uh, generally, there are two main groups of uh, homomorphic cryptography. There is partially homomorphic crypto systems that support just one operation, such as addition or multiplication. And there are fully homomorphic crypto systems that came to be quite recently. Uh, one of uh, the most well known is the Gentry scheme, which was invented in 2009. Um, and Gentry scheme is able to do both addition and uh, multiplication. Of course, uh, homomorphic cryptography is significantly slower than uh, plain text operations. So this is timings for plain text. And these are timings for different homomorphic crypto systems. And you can see that the difference is very, very significant. Typically we talk about 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times slower than working with plain text, but in certain cases, uh, this is a worthy trade-off. Um, then uh, next thing uh, is tokenization. So tokenization is uh, sometimes we want to join the data sets coming from different sources, uh, but certain items in these data sets we don't want or we are not allowed to share, such as, for example, an RIC number, uh, address, first and last name, date of birth, things like that, phone number. Uh, these are what's called a pers per, uh, personally identifiable information. And there are regulations in almost every country that don't allow companies to share this data with anybody. However, if we want to do a joint analysis, we want to understand that certain customer from one company is the same customer from another company. So we can understand some patterns uh, for customers happening across companies. So we would like to be able to join the uh, data sets uh, coming from, let's say, two banks or uh, any two organizations. And we want to run the analysis somewhere in a central location, but we are not allowed to disclose information such as under IC. So since we're not allowed to disclose this information, we might consider to substitute it with a token. Uh, so in order to mask this value. So for example, we substitute one with a random token and another with a random token. The problem with this is that now we can't match these two records because the random tokens are different. So we want to still be able to join data. And this is where distributed tokenization comes in. This is an approach that allows companies to tokenize their uh, encrypted uh, their sensitive values in the same way without actually sharing the values with each other. So this uh, requires some kind of protocol between the organizations, and then they are able to uh, join their data sets and not violate any regulations and not um, risk the, uh, the, uh, the sensitive data. Then we have federated learning. Uh, in classic machine learning, uh, usually we have uh, data sets that are coming from all kinds of sources into a central location, and then the central location crunches the data and produces a uh, learned model. However, again, the same problem, we often are not allowed or don't want to share the data. So federated learning is an approach that uh, was created to fight that. Instead of sharing the data, every party uh, creates a small local model based on only on their data. Instead of sharing the data, they then share 
only their small model. And then these models are combined into one larger model. So there are many approaches to do this. It is a hot research topic. And this is very um, interesting today when a lot of companies really want to go to um, joint data analysis, but they just can't share the data. To go even further into the realm of joint analysis, there is secure multi-party computation where not only we can run some uh, data, uh, some machine learning algorithms uh, in this distributed fashion, but uh, SMPC actually provides us with a tool set to run arbitrary analysis, arbitrary programs uh, across uh, disjoint data sets being hosted at different parties. So a very simple example of uh, how SMPC works. Let's assume we have three parties, uh, Alice, Bob, and Eve, and they have apples, and they want to know how many apples they have in total. So they would, uh, SMPC typically comes in three steps. First step is uh, the so-called linear secret sharing, where we uh, split our data uh, at each party and we send the shares of the data to other parties. The second step is uh, local analysis. And then the third step is aggregation. So in the linear secret sharing uh, step, every data uh, piece is split into shares. So for example, uh, Alice had four. So now we split it into three shares, one, one, and two. If we add them together, we get our four. And then they exchange the shares so that every agent receives a share of the um, original data. They exchange the shares and then they run the second step, the local analysis phase, where they do certain local computations with the shares. In this case, they will just add all the shares together. And then they move to the third step, the aggregation, where they uh, send each other, all the intermediate results. They exchange the intermediate results and then they all, uh, in the third step, in this case, they all add them together. And the result of this analysis is 14, which is indeed the total number of apples that they had. So this is, again, is a very simple example, but it shows how SMPC works and actually modern SMPC systems allow us to uh, run arbitrary programs of any complexity in a distributed fashion. So SMPC is distributed in nature, unlike, for example, homomorphic cryptography that could be centralized. SMPC requires at least two parties, usually more. But SMPC can run in much more highly untrusted environments. Uh, it implements something what's called N minus one security, where uh, if all but one agents are compromised, still the data is secure. And SMPC is not really fast, and the speed directly depends on the number of nodes. Uh, and usually it is slower than homomorphic cryptography. So uh, last thing that I want to talk about is uh, audit trail and event sourcing. So in a classic approach in a cybersecurity world, we um, try to log everything that happens. And all apps and all systems send their logs to a centralized security information and event management system or SIEM. So, some problems with that are, even though this is really helpful and this is actually often required by regulations, some problems with that are that logs can be amended after they are collected. And uh, we have arbitrary log granularity. Certain uh, apps could be really detailed and other apps could be really uh, stingy on what they share in the logs. So we might not have enough information, but of course it's better than nothing and it's a requirement so companies do this. And it is indeed often helpful in investigating a security incident. So we will try to uh, demonstrate how we can fight the two problems that we highlighted here. So first of all, logs can be amended. So what we want is ideally an immutable audit trail so that logs cannot be changed. So if we want to have an immutable and unforgeable uh, audit trail, this would require that, first of all, it's stored in a distributed fashion so that nobody can destroy it. 
uh, or it's really hard to destroy it. Uh, we want to have strong guarantees of immutability and we have means of detecting forgery. So if somebody is trying to add certain records to our audit trail, we want to be able to tell that these records are not actually the legit ones. And as a matter of fact, there is a technology that fits this description perfectly. And this technology is called blockchain. It is a distributed ledger with cryptographic guarantees of immutability and forgeability. This is ideal for this kind of scenario. So it is a, um, it is a really good idea to adapt blockchain to be used as a um, log storage for, for audit trail. And if we go even further, uh, we can come to an idea of event sourcing. So uh, the problem with another problem with logs is that they might emit crucial information because different apps have different level of detail at which they share the data. So what if we have, what if we have, can somehow guarantee that all the information is stored in the logs? And if we go even further, we can come to the idea of event sourcing where what if logs are actually all the information we have and we don't have anything else except of the logs. And the best illustration of this approach is the way uh, the chess uh, games are recorded. So instead of uh, just showing current states for every uh, step of the game, for every um, move, we have a full log of the game where every move of every um, figure is recorded. And even though we don't have a full state at any moment, we know the initial state and we know the full log. So for any moment in time that we want to see uh, what was the state of the game at this point, we can take the original uh, positions of all the uh, figures and we can trace all the movements of all the uh, figures on the board and we can find out what was the uh, positions on the board at any point in time. So this is the idea of event sourcing. Uh, and some companies are actually adopting this instead of keeping the current state and the current uh, record for everything, they keep the whole um, list of events, all the changes to the data that happened. And this way, uh, not only they have the current state always available, but they can go arbitrary uh, back in time in their data and see how the data changed over time. So um, at A-Prismatic, we are trying to put uh, all of this together. Uh, and the system that one of the systems that we are working on uh, with uh, one of our partners uh, is a system that tries to combine all of this. So the uh, one of our subsystems is called Prisma, which is a uh, data analysis, uh, storage and analysis system based on homomorphic cryptography, uh, an SMPC engine, uh, a SMPC engine that also might have um, nodes of distri distributed nodes with the users that send in the data. Uh, then the token, uh, tokenization systems, uh, either centralized or uh, distributed uh, tokenizers and the blockchain for uh, the audit trail. And then the users can send their data, uh, use the tokenizer, either a centralized or a distributed, uh, do the analysis in homomorphic engine or in the SMPC engine and lock all the um, actions that were taken in the um, blockchain. So this is something that uh, we are working on and uh, that's all. That's all from me. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vasily. Um, I have a quick question for you. Uh, thanks for sharing. So with the kind of technology that you have, what kind of companies would you like to collaborate with? So um, generally any company that is worried uh, about their data. So we, we are working with, uh, we're working with some government agencies in Singapore. We are talking to financial institutions. Um, of course, some companies uh, that have higher regulation uh, requirements, uh, but mm -hmm. generally any company that works with the customer data and is worried about um, 
security of the data. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So if any of the attendees here today are fall into those categories, um, please reach out to Dr. Uh, Vasily and then you guys can collaborate together. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker for today is Dr. Sumanda Bos um, from Data Crew Private Limited. He will be talking about the uh, MEDS IoT platform and the ITUS Secure IoT Node Edge and then Analytics Gateway. Um, so I will hand over to Dr. Bos. Yeah, Dr. Bos, for you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> is it uh, visible now? Yes, but you need to go full screen. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, is it good now? Yes, it's good. Okay. So uh, thank you all for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, present our technology to you. Uh, the topic for today's presentation was actually this uh, MADS IoT platform and ITES Secure Edge, but I just took the liberty to make it more presentable and uh, come up with a more holistic uh, title, Reliable and Secure IoT Solutions to Unlock the Full Potential of a Connected Tomorrow. And a quick introduction about myself and the company before I move any forward. Uh, so the company is called Data Crew and uh, it was founded in 2019 in Singapore by a bunch of PhD researchers and faculty from NTU. We got support from Intuitive and uh, Singapore government grants. And we are in the space of IoT, AI and data security. And uh, what we offer is a no code IoT platform which is called MADS and it helps to shorten IoT deployment time from months to days and uh, secure IoT node and gateway for uh, ensuring future-proof quantum security. But don't be alarmed, I'm going to take you through this uh, so that you can appreciate what these terms mean and what we do. And a quick background about myself, I'm the founder and CEO of Data Crew, and I did my PhD from Tripoli in NTU. Uh, and then I served as a research scientist at Temasek Laboratories in the Center for Cyber Hardware and Forensics. Uh, and I have uh, been in the academic in, uh, academics for a while with over 50 publications and then went on to do my startup from 2019 onwards. We have support from a bunch of uh, Singapore based startup, uh, you know, support systems, including Enterprise Singapore, Intuitive, and a bunch of other supportive people. And uh, we are in the IoT space, so let me take you through that journey and help you uh, appreciate this a little bit more. IoT is a technology which is all pervasive, and uh, in the years to come, it's going to be even more so. It can connect any device with any people, anybody, anywhere, and it's applicable for any business. It can latch on to any network, and you can get the real-time data from any devices. Already, there are 30 billion over devices as we speak now, and it's going to double over the next five years. And the total market capitalization would reach over $1 trillion by 2025. And it's going to de define the next decade of connectivity in both businesses and homes. Data Crew is a company which is an IoT platform company on the software front, which means it helps to assimilate all the data coming in from the different IoT sources. And it's a on the hardware side, we provide IoT gateway, which means that we can uh, connect with any given IoT sensor and from any of these applications, these multiple application areas, including utilities, transportation, smart cities, manufacturing, and so on. So the application areas are far and wide, but for the sake of today's presentation, I'll be taking up a use case, which is IoT technology for predictive maintenance of ship machinery. So uh, the problem statement is that ships are one of the most like the shipping industry is one of the most important industries that enable global trade over 90 percent of the products that we use today are shipped through the seas and it's very important that these ships keep running on time on schedule and as per uh, expected but many times what happens is that these ships which are actually huge set of machinery they have huge turbines and motors and engines and bunch of other stuff. They suffer from, you know, untimely machine failure. Uh, the equipments fail uh, when they're not expected to, or they fail suddenly while the ship is on the sheet uh, on the on the sea. And uh, 
these failures are not easy to understand or easy to uh, trace because even until today, uh, most of the data recording is done manually by the operators and the uh, crew of the ship. And they log this data into multiple softwares and the management of the, of the ships, the operators of the ships have to scan through all those different software. And, and uh, many a times it's done uh, through traditional means like logging data into a spreadsheet. So it's really hard to ensure that the ships don't break down all of a sudden. That's why the term predictive maintenance, we are expected or we are supposed to predict when the maintenance is required so that we can do it beforehand, before a, you know untimely breakdown happens. And in order to uh, implement our solution, we have a threefold approach. The first is data acquisition, which is the hardware layer where we answer the question that what sensor data do we acquire from each machinery, how and why? Second layer is the data transmission layer, which is the communication layer. How do we reliably collect the data and transmit it securely? And the third is the data analytics, which is the software layer. How do we collect the data from multiple sources, analyze it, visualize it, and gain insight? And at the end of the day, what we are supposed to do is predict that, okay, at this point of time, maintenance is required because the equipments are probably going to fail. So let's uh, go through this uh, three steps one by one. The first is the data acquisition. So this is a grid of commonly found machinery in a ship and the different kind of sensors that might be useful. And then there is logic and reason behind which sensor needs to be used for what kind of machinery. So take an analogy, basically these machines are like people and the sensors are like the different medical tests. So you'd go for a, you know, a test of your, uh, you, you'd go for a blood test if, if, if the doctor recommends you for a particular uh, you know, test if you if the doctor is wants to find out whether you have some particular disease or not. Likewise, there is there is a reason and logic behind every kind of sensor. So let's take a li little bit deeper look into uh, motors, for example. So uh, the vibration sensor is used to detect misalignment. Current sensor is used to detect uh, cracked rotors and bars. Temperature sensor for bearing issues ultrasound sensor for lubrication is issues. So in essence, uh, what I'm trying to say here is, there is, uh, uh, there is a guideline or there is a, there is a reason behind which sensor is used for what kind of equipment and, and under what kind of circumstances. And as a company, we bring in our domain expertise to recommend and, and, and uh, consult the customers as to what sensors might be necessary. Now, once we have installed the sensors and we have start uh, we, we have started collecting the data. The second part, which is the data transmission part comes into the picture. So, oh, even before that, let me also tell you about the, uh, the different location and uh, uh, orientation of the sensors. So it's like, uh, for example, you would want to measure the vibration in a motor. It also matters where and how you place the sensor. So for example, in this illustration, we are showing that a vibration sensor is in, installed at a, a vertical location and, and a horizontal location. And then there are different kind of diagnosis that we can get out of the different locations and different orientations of where the sensor is installed. And then once we have installed the sensor, we have to uh, securely transmit the data. So it, the second part is the data transmission. So in this illustration, what I'm showing is a ship and in the center of the ship in the blue circle is our product called ITIS Gateway, which can connect with multiple ITIS nodes, which are in the yellow circles over a LoRa or a Wison mesh. So what happens in a mesh is everyone talks to everyone. So you do not necessarily need to uh, rely on one particular route to forward the data. So if there is a lack of connectivity with one of the peers, the the uh, node can transmit the data by hopping it through a bunch of other peers because almost everyone is talking to everyone in this mesh network. And once you have, once you have collected the data from the different places or the different parts of your ship, you would want to transmit it. And then uh, let me remind you, there is no 3G or 4G connectivity out there in the sea, in the middle of the you know, deep sea. 
or, or uh, there is even no Wi-Fi connectivity as such. So we must rely on satellite connectivity. So the ITAS gateway is capable of uplinking the data to an IoT nano satellite 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface and almost uh, rotating, uh, like, uh, rotating every one hour uh, to make a complete circle around the Earth. And, and alternately, there is this VSAT satellite at uh, 36,000 kilometers, which is uh, uh, rotating with the Earth, which means one time a day. So basically, it remains on top of us throughout as, as, the, as the Earth rotates. So basically, the idea is to transmit the signal to the satellite and bring it back to the ground station so that we can uh, do the analytics uh, at a later point of time. But while we do this, it's important to also take care of security because IoT without security is uh, internet of threats. A quick example here, let's say there is a water tank and it's 50% full, oh, sorry, it's, it's full in reality, but there is a sensor on top of it, which, which is supposed to collect, uh, measure the sen uh, depth of the water and the sensor is hacked and the value is fixed at 50%. The server would believe, falsely believe, that the water tank is only half full and at a later point of time would want to feed in more water into the tank and eventually it will result in tank overflow. Now, this is a real problem to assets because it will result in uh, you know, asset losses, which, which is a direct translation into financial loss and even reputational loss if it goes into the public domain. And this is a real threat because over 98% of IoT traffic is unencrypted. And this results in losses of millions in, in, of dollars annually. What we have been able to do is come up with this technology called quantum secure perimeter. This is a virtual fence around critical IoT assets. And in the case of a cyber attack, the affected assets are isolated and quarantined, much like we do with an infected person with COVID-19. So let's say this sensor or this uh, ITAS node uh, has been detected to uh, have an intrusion attack or a manipulation attack. And there are ways to do that. We, we, we capture the trend of the data at a very high frequency rates. And just as soon as a flag is raised, those assets are isolated and quarantined so that it wouldn't affect the rest of the network. Now, once we have securely captured the data and transmitted it, the third part, which is the data analytics part, comes into the picture. So today's maritime software landscape is extremely fragmented. This gives an overview of the different type of software that has been used uh, to do the different aspects of work. We know from our customers that they say that in a day, they use over 20 different software just to get through the day and, and look at the performance of the ships and so, and so on. What we are trying to do is come up with an integrable platform which can be integrated which, with third-party software and third-party hardware and make it a one-stop shop. It would have an expandable app store such that tomorrow when there is a need for a new uh, use case or a new feature, we can just simply publish a new app onto the app store and wouldn't have to disrupt the entire software system to do uh, you know, new, new updates and upgrades. And the apps themselves are customizable to the extent that with just drag and drops, uh, you, can, you can create custom IoT solution. So in essence, MADS, this entire platform that we call MADS, MADS is like Android for IoT. It is a platform to implement IoT solutions such as predictive maintenance that we are talking about today. And how does it look? How does it look and feel? So this is the look and feel of the Maths platform. There is an app launcher, just like you would have in a Windows or a Mac environment. There is this bunch of apps and uh, there's a task bar at the bottom with pinned apps. Your favorite apps can be pinned. There is a system tray and a bunch of uh, different uh, settings in the system tray and so on. So it's a very intuitive and easy to use platform, uh, the Maths platform that we have built. So uh, and it comes with a bunch of apps, which is, which is published by us or, or by third party providers. So this is an overview of the different apps available in the Mads App Store under the six categories of core productivity, management, analytics, security, and general. Uh, might look uh, a lot 
but for today's presentation, let's focus on only four uh, for the use case of predictive maintenance that we're talking about. So dashboards, digital twin, data cruncher, and data insights is what I'll be focusing on. The dashboards app is an app to create multiple dashboards just with a click of a button. So there is a no code interface to create n number of dashboards collecting data and, and visualizing data from different sources. And uh, it has uh, no code UI to create widgets like pie chart, bar chart, column chart, and so on. And uh, you can share it with your colleagues and friends with the export button and create n number of dashboards and, and within the dashboard create as many tabs as you want. So this is an easy visualization tool that we have made. The next is the digital twin which allows us to import or build any 3D model and place AI driven markers on the, on, the, on the 3D model itself. So in this example, we are showing a ship and it, it says crane one needs maintenance. Engine room has five alerts in the last three days. The rudder, the load is down by 7% and a bunch of uh, you know, gauges on the right side to give you an estimate of how your ship is performing. So you see, uh, from a ship operator's point of view, this is extremely easy because it gives a 3D visualization of their actual asset, actual ship. And then on the, on the asset itself, we can place markers to give an essence of how is it performing? Does it need maintenance? Does it need any uh, you know, immediate action to be taken and so on? The next app is the Data Cruncher app. This is a flow-based programming for robotic process automation. In the example that I'm showing, what I'm doing is I'm capturing the vibration data from one of the uh, motors, and then I'm doing a quick fast Fourier transform. But then this is the most important part where I'm throwing the data into an ARIMA machine learning predictor to predict how my vibration signal is going to be in the near future, maybe in the next one day or so. And then I'm going to put that into a data condition box. And if the data condition which I can customly define that should it meet certain threshold or should it meet certain threshold for particular amount of time or, or whatever other custom logic I would want to create. If that's true, I would want it to send a WhatsApp alert to my operator's, uh, operator's phone. So you see this custom logic we could just create by connecting data boxes, functions and action items. And uh, you, you know, you can imagine the, the amount of customization that's possible because any kind of logic that you would want to create, you can, you can just drag and drop the function and the data modules and connect them with arrows. And, and that's all, voila, you have created a custom logic for your IoT uh, analytics and data analytics and, and, and data uh, automation. The, third, the fourth uh, app I'm gonna talk about is the Data Insights app, which is the, uh, you know, ex, uh, like Tableau or Power BI equivalent of uh, IoT analytics. If, if any of the, uh, if any of you have used Tableau or Power BI for uh, 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 data analytics purposes. Uh, also, let, let me give an, another analogy. If you have used uh, pivot tables in Microsoft Excel, uh, it's something like that. But the thing is, until until now, so uh, you know, IoT was creating so much data, but it was rather going unutilized or unanalyzed because what most providers provide is you is the ability to download a lot of data in Excel format. And then it's up to you. Where do you upload the data? How do you do the analytics? You would probably have to use another tool like Tableau or something to go and analyze the data. But we, we are bringing the power of uh, collective data analytics and aggregated data analytics right into the maths platform where we can create uh, you know, uh, uh, analytics and visualization such as this on the screen. What we are showing here is a heat map of energy consumption across day and hour uh, in, a, in a given uh, factory. So what happens is we are showing that, okay, uh, you know, on, on these days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and on these hours, maybe hour three, four, five, or hour 14, 15, 16, the energy consumption is the highest. So it gives us a bird's eye overview. And this is just an example where I have shown a heat map. We can also do scatter plot, bubble chart, and so on, uh, right from within the platform. So, uh, yeah. And uh, finally, I'd also like to share about some of the case studies and customer benefits that we have derived from some of our ongoing projects. 
so these are some of our key projects that we have undertaken or in the process of uh, executing. So the first is Halcyon, which is a rubber manufacturing franchisee. We have gathered sensor data and cut down water usage by 30%, which is a huge cost saving for the uh, factory. Uh, another example is SBS Transit. I'm sure you all know it, uh, SBS Transit, because you have uh, taken buses and trains. We have uh, deployed 24 seven GPS analytics and reduced maintenance alerts by 50%. Because earlier, even, even you know, it's surprising even in 2020, uh, until a few days, a few months ago, the operators used to take down readings manually and then log on to an Excel sheet. And often they would do manual errors and, and it would uh, result in a lot of confusion among the maintenance staff. And these are some insights that we have gathered directly from the customer. Uh, VFloatic is another company, which is uh, a company from Arian uh, in NTU. Uh, what we have done is we have helped them to uh, do real-time uh, analysis of energy generation and storage. And there is a potential of saving over $200,000 per year in a, in a uh, utility scale 10 megawatt system, but we have done uh, a proof of concept so far and with promising hopes of, of scaling it. And TriStar is an energy logistics company. What we are giving them is exactly the presentation that I showed you today, which is the predictive maintenance of ships. And we learned from that them that uh, uh, their, their objective is to cut down uh, fuel usage by effective predictive maintenance. And the impact is huge. So the impact, financial impact is over $450,000 per ship per year, even if the fuel uh, usage is cut down by 1%, but even more uh, impact would be on the, on the uh, you know, environmental level where we can cut down on carbon emission and so on. Uh, so these are some of the things that we are doing. With that, I would like to stop my presentation. And uh, final word is that uh, what we are trying to do is create reliable and secure IoT solutions uh, to unlock the full potential of a connected tomorrow. Uh, below is my phone number, and uh, this is a generic company email ID. But uh, please feel free to ask questions or, or reach out to me if, if there is something of interest to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bose. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, let me just ask you, um, for the sake of our attendees, what kind of companies are you looking to work with or to collaborate with? So, uh, you know, any kind of company who is looking to collect data from sensors and, and improve the process. For example, any kind of company who is looking to digitize processes, digitize factories, digitize buildings, mm -hmm. digitize transportation system, we are happy to work with them. So this particular slide gives an overview of the different domains of company that we are uh, that, that that we can serve and that we can work with great thank you very much thank you um, for everybody here the session has been recorded and we will share it with everybody who has attended the session today um, at the same time any questions that you may have um, we will also be able to either already answer them i think or we'll take them later and we'll answer them through another email to you um, the slides will also be shared to you just as a form of reference, so no worries. The contact details of our speakers are also in their slides. Yeah. Um, for those who have taken time out this morning to join us, thank you so much. We hope that you have enjoyed the networking session. You'll continue to collaborate amongst yourselves and with our speakers to create more innovation together. Before you leave, we'd like for you to fill up the survey on your screen right now. Uh, Joanne, if you can pull up the survey, just to facilitate follow-ups. Just a quick one, thank you guys. The first one says, I would like to be connected with, you know, so you can actually key down, uh, you can type in, you can actually press on the buttons of those that you would like to be connected with. We have uh, all our speakers over there. Uh, from Intuitive, uh, so that would be Dr. Shawa, um, Professor Xie Li Hua, uh, Dr. Vasili, and Dr. Bos. yeah. And of course, ourselves, IMDA Open Innovation Platform, if you'd like to find out more about what we do, how we help companies uh, work together. And also would like to know if you found the session informative and would you be keen to join more such events in the future so we can keep you on our mailing list. Um, and also whether you have specific technology requirements or commercial applications that are not covered in this session and you would like to explore it with uh, NTU Intuitive, yeah? If your response is yes, um, Intuitive team will get back to you directly on this. 
So just let it run for another maybe 30 seconds. Thank you everybody for helping us with our survey. Hey, Sumanta. Yes. Uh, there is one message in the chat box. Uh, somebody is interested in talking to you. Maybe you can note down the email before we close the session. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chava. Yeah. If you have not noticed, then you will miss that. Thank you. <clears throat> For those who are raising your hands, um, I believe that you actually may have questions or uh, any information that you'd like to share. You can put it into the Q&A box. I'll try to take it. To answer your question, Sabrina, there's no link to the survey. We will actually um, collect all the data that we um, are uh, gathering right now. And if you like, we can, we are, we'll be able to share the, the results. Yeah. I think there is one question, Sumanta. I think probably that's for you. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, where can I see the question? Oh, yeah. Um, I can read it out to you, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Bush. Um, basically, um, Mari Rajan is saying that uh, he or she has worked on predictive maintenance scheduling for oil and gas commission for offshore platform. How is the cost of satellite acceptable? I think that's the question. Right, so uh, quick answer to that question is, uh, many of the ships already have uh, ODM, which is a connect connection to the VSAT satellite because onboard ships uh, for internet connectivity of the crew members, uh, you would have to have a VSAT communication uplink anyway. So we can use the existing VSAT satellite communication uplink, uplink or we can use uh, IoT nano satellites. So IoT nano satellites are a very upcoming and recent technology, and it's a very small satellite, a CubeSat. It's basically the size of, let's say, uh, you know, you know, a, a, a takeaway box, a takeaway box from the food court. Maybe that size the, the, is the satellite size. It's a CubeSat, and it's uh, launched uh, by a few companies from France, and they they let us purchase bandwidth on a per message or a per KB basis. So. Of course, we will have to work out the exact number of KB you, we want to use per day so as to optimize the cost. Uh, but it's workable uh, because, because from the IoT, anyway, the amount of data produced is not huge. We can compress the data or, or send data every one hour or so, and we can uh, use the existing infrastructure provided by the satellite companies. On the hardware side, what we have to do is we have to enable it to be able to connect with the uh, satellite. So for that, special chipsets are available, and it's it's uh, something which is totally doable. I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, I'm also happy to connect later again with uh, Mari Rajan. Uh, I can share my email ID in the common chat, Mari Rajan, and you can you can send me an email. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Boss. Yeah, so Mari Rajan, if uh, I hope that answers your question, Dr. Boss will share his email address with you. You guys can connect and take it further, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Profs, yeah, if you're still around, someone's also asking for your email contact if you were able to share it directly with him. Yeah. Um, I think that's the end of our session. Uh, should we end the end the poll? Yeah. Yeah. Um, looks good. Thank you everyone for voting. Um and thank you for saying that you would like to be connected with us. We will definitely get in touch with you. Um, for those of you who want to get in touch with the speakers, we'll reach out to you with their email address later. Yeah. So once again, thank you for taking time out this morning to join us. And we hope that you enjoyed the session. You continue to collaborate amongst yourselves and the speakers to create more innovation. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. So have a great week ahead. And uh, we'll hope to see you at the next session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chava. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.